Hey guys, welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time for joining us for another Fit Nation Lunch and Learn. Joining us this week from the great city of Rotterdam is Jennifer Halsell DeWitt. She's the COO at the Women in Fitness Association, and she's also a marketing expert. So she's had a number of key roles in the industry throughout her career. And today we're going to talk about how you can or share tips on how to improve your fitness marketing strategy, some quick wins you can achieve in your marketing efforts, as well as highlight some strategies for long-term success that will allow you to grow your business while at the same time retaining your passion. So yeah, without further ado, Jennifer, thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm super excited. I love these conversations. <laughs> awesome. We are definitely looking forward to it as well. Um, always a good starting point for sure to, to maybe you could just give us a little bit of your background story and, and tell us a little bit about what you do. Right. So, um, it, you know, I, I clearly am not Dutch. You can hear that from my accent. Although, uh, Alex, you also live in Rotterdam. So our accent is increasingly common in, in Rotterdam, actually. So maybe it's the new Dutch accent. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I, I was born in Canada. I was raised in the States and moved back to Canada as an adult. And I, I, I grew up in a gym. So my dad had a small personal training studio back in the 90s where it was like homemade equipment. And I don't know if this will speak to anybody, but donkey calf raises was still like a popular exercise when we were when we were using human weights. Um, so I, I was a human weight for for a lot of my for a lot of my youth, but um, I didn't actually expect that I would end up in the fitness sector. I thought I was going to be a journalist until I did an internship and realized that was not going to be my future. So a um, very, very long story short, I ended up a, a very successful personal trainer in the Canadian market. And because I just I just truly found my place. I was able to grow quickly and work for uh, four of the largest um, corporately run fitness chains in the world, uh, mostly in uh, product development uh, capacities. So, or I was running the personal training department or I was creating the personal training group fitness department. And uh, I was able to find a job over here with um, the, the founder and CEO of Basic Fit and Health City. And I came to help him start his fitness departments uh, 10 years ago. So that's why I'm here. And uh, about 10 years after uh, that, that choice, I decided it was time for another change. And because I've worked for profit um, for, for so many years, uh, I, I was really ex uh, interested to, to explore the nonprofit side of things to really kind of pursue, pursue my passion and my heart and help uh, progress the sector in many ways. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's how I ended up with uh, the Women in Fitness Association. And a lot of people don't actually know how to pronounce uh, our, our acronym and it's WIFA. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to, to be able to unite the women of the fitness sector and help progress our sector in the area of uh, DEI initiatives and uh, getting more women in leadership and helping uh, the careers for more women in fitness. And then, yeah, other than that, I am a, I, I'm a mom, I'm a stepmom, I'm a dog mom, and uh, I stay busy. <laughs> awesome. Great, great background. Thank you for that. Um, before we start talking about all the marketing aspects and things, uh, I'd be curious to get your take, having worked on both sides of the pond in the, the fitness industry, maybe some of the differences you see between the North American market and the European market, and then maybe off of that, some things you think one could learn from the other or, or vice versa. Well, I, I think one of the really cool things that has happened in, in the during the pandemic is, is the increase of communication globally um, for our sector. So we're, we're talking more and sharing more than we ever have before. And I think that's just gonna make us collectively stronger. Um, yeah, what's funny is that like the, the, the US market has always been kind of the epicenter of the, of the fitness sector. And um, has has a lot of kind of strong founding sector advantages, but the other the other um, markets around the globe 
I wouldn't say are catching up because they're just expressing differently. So, so what I think is is really strong in the in the U.S. market is just the absolute abundance and variety of fitness offerings, um, and that that comes in in great part from the fact that there is an abundance of fitness education that that is really the differentiate differentiating factor for the other markets. So because it, there, there are so many options to kind of train yourself in, in fitness, wellness, wellness, health specializations, um, th that there is a huge amount of fitness professionals in the, in the States that is just not um, you, you don't really see it as much, especially in the European market, because of the of the languages. Because any uh, education operator that would want to exist over here would have to actually translate into any language that they would like to be uh, part uh, participate participating in the country of. Um, that that makes it really hard to scale in Europe. So I think. Um, it, I won't say it's it's a limiting factor, but it, it's something that that has slowed the European market down because it makes it a barrier to enter to enter um, the continent because you have to take the the language factor into consideration. So I think um, the overall offering in in the in the U.S. and I would say like the English language markets. This is also true for all of them. Um, there's more education off offerings, and because there's more education offerings, there is uh, continuing education requirements uh, that make it really important for the fitness professionals to stay engaged in their craft. And uh, that doesn't exist to the extent here that it does there. So it, it impacts the retention of the fitness professionals, I think. Um, and also from a career development standpoint, because you can continue to progress and educate yourself, you can continue to um, grow your 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 offering for your clients or your members or whatever and grow your income in different ways as you advance and specialize and um the the european fit pros are are a little bit uh behind the the american uh fit pros in that in that um capacity and uh i think that because of the employment laws, uh, the differences in employment laws uh, for the US versus Europe, it's much easier and cheaper for employers to, to offer uh, employed positions to personal trainers and, and fit pros, whereas in Europe, um, there are more freelance options. So it, it's just, it, it, it's neither good nor bad. It's just a completely different approach and, and different experience for the customers. And I think on the European side, um, I feel like the, 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 the professionalization of the sector in Europe is, is a bit further than it is in uh, the US. And I, I, I sit close to that point because I'm, I'm a member of the ESOSEN group that is writing the fitness, health and safety standard for our sector. Um, so requirements for education for our, uh, for our staff, requirements for safety for our facilities, like uh, the, those are all things that uh, are, are clearly worked out for our sector over here. Um, and I feel like the European market is further on the on the digital offering in terms of the different digital channels that are being uh, that are being offered in terms of uh, client services, client communications, um, uh, the, the fact that that uh, years before I ever saw this in the states, I would see like the big touch screens in in um, fitness clubs in Europe that people were using for. Uh, for, for fitness information. Um, and, it, and it seems like there's more investment on like IT infrastructure, data analytics, and like business information infrastructure in the big companies in Europe compared to those that I know in the, in the States. So keep, keep that, uh, 
keep that there could be a big ignorance blind spot for me in a lot of these statements is just my perception and opinion. No, I, I think that's a really actually pretty interesting perspective, some surprising things there, especially around like the IT infrastructure um, that you mentioned. But I think if, if there is someone who knows and has seen that firsthand, uh, I think you'd definitely be a, a good candidate to, to speak on that. Um, okay, so that, that, that's quite interesting to know. Shifting gears then a little bit, we're, we're going to talk a lot about marketing strategies and marketing efforts today. Um, so I suppose if we, you know, the purpose of this conversation, a lot of it is going to focus on vision and purpose of the company. So maybe if we want to start from like the very beginning, we could get your take on some common maybe marketing mistakes you see either those who are starting a business or those who are thinking about expanding it, like what kind of pitfalls could they potentially um, get started if they don't have the right guidance? I think um, uh, that's a really awesome question. I think uh, the, the fitness sector is full of really, really passionate people who are um, tend to run thing at things at things full steam with with their passion. But uh, often we still need to remember that it's still a business. And uh, there, there, there's a lot of time and thought that, and clarity that needs to go into strategy because a lot, of the, a lot of the questions that we're talking about have to do with marketing strategy. Well, strategy is big picture. So you have to have taken the time for big picture. And the first big um, question that you, you have to be able to answer as a co company is like, why do you exist? Like, what is the impact that you want to make as a company? Because that um, essence has to come through in everything. It's the filter that you pass everything through. So taking the time to really explore your purpose and your mission and to articulate that really well as a company. And it's, it's hard work. And I would, I would advise people who are listening to this and just going, yeah, that sounds great, but I have no idea how how to start with this. I mean, like Simon Sinek has an amazing TED Talk. That's that's the easiest jumping off point. But there's a lot of coaches that help you do work, like business coaches who help you get clear on this. And if you're going to invest in anything in the beginning of your business, having having a clear take on your perfect purpose is, go, is going to guide your product it's going to guide your service it's going to guide your brand it's going to guide your voice uh, and it's going to help you attract the the customer that you're meant to attract so it's just essential work that you that you need to do and then uh, like once once you've done that work believe it or not everything gets a whole lot more clear in terms of uh, the rest of how you want to how you want to set your business up, um, the 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 business rules, the uh, the customers that you're targeting, like all of those questions really have to be answered in order to create a marketing strategy. Because otherwise, it's it's just a little bit of like spray and pray. It sounds good. You're you're ripping off and duplicating what you see in the market, but you haven't taken the time to kind of. Uh, get to know your company and your company's personality to start putting putting that that work out. So I'd say um, it, that that that's essentially the the starting point that you can build off everything. Yeah, and you know we we see that too, and it sounds easy when you see them in hindsight. These examples, but if you think of like the North Star metrics of, for, of some of the biggest companies in the world that we know. So for Spotify, it's the you know amount of monthly listeners or for, um, you know, for example, Uber, it's rides per week for LinkedIn, it's monthly active users. It's really about finding that like North star metric that really defines what your goals are and, and where you're going to be focused on yeah. and then building back from there. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, and, and like, once you, once you have that, like, if you're, if you're talking about being a, being a studio or a boutique or even a personal trainer is like, um, what, what is going to be that thing where that you're measuring to know that your business is successful. So if it's number of members, then, then all of your effort has to be focused on getting to the, getting to the North star. And the trick is not to get distracted by, by all of the little fluffy bunnies along the way. Right. Because they crop up and they're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a good good way to put it. Um, yeah. So if, if you want to maybe say uh, you, you might call it a bunny, but other people might see it as a pitfall or a mistake, um, what would you say are like some trigger signs that they're kind of pursuing these bunnies instead of the the North Star metric there? Yeah, I mean, it, like the. I think the North Star analogy is like, it, it, when you can see the North Star in the sky, you know the direction to go. So it is ultimately about clarity. And uh, when, when you are, when you're out of sync with it, the, the signs that you're out of sync with it are really, um, when you're lost in the busy, when you're constantly reacting to things and you're finding, that you can't find the time to step back and do and do planning forward to look at your strategy. If you have no time or energy for strategy, that's a big red flag. Um, if if you are uh, if you're not able to really um, think through the the campaigns and the efforts that you're putting out there for for a new member or new client or new customer acquisition to 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 see if they're actually working for you if you're just kind of in the in the go process without the without kind of an analysis check like how is this actually working for me and how do i know this is actually working for me um and and if you if you're constantly feeling like that there's absolutely no possibility to hand off anything and all of the weights on you. Um, y- you've, you've, uh, collected too many fluffy bunnies. Yeah. Yeah. You touched on it already, but it is, it's kind of that nature of someone who is uh, an entrepreneur in the fitness industry is that they are very self-reliant. They want to be doing everything themselves, but this can actually be long-term one of their undoings as a business and also kind of their passion for the industry if they thought that they could take everything on themselves and it ends up weighing them down. Yeah. I mean, actually that's one of the, one of the things that I, that I got to see from one of our sector's greatest entrepreneurs is, is the um, founder and CEO of Health City Basic Fit, Renee Mose. Like it, they're, they're plowing towards a, a thousand, um, a thousand locations like the, the you know 25 years ago he was he was teaching tennis lessons like he's a beautiful uh, example of a of an entrepreneur uh, but what he does and what I've, I've seen him do exceptionally is he focuses on the things that he's excellent at and he lets everybody else do the rest so really building a team and allowing like building a well-balanced team who understands kind of their domains of excellence and giving enough trust and independence for people to do that, their work, but unifying under that, under that vision and purpose is the way that you can be successful in, in business, whether you want one successful studio or a thousand. Yeah. Nice. And I, I think that's, you really, nailed it there when you say like focus on what you're excellent on and then let the other people do the rest and and ideally it'd be what they're excellent at exactly and then that's and, and then that's when the machine really starts to to pick up uh pick up some momentum um so on, on that note then if we want to think about the you know if someone's listening and they heard some of those pitfalls and they can look themselves in the mirror and say hey I, i'm probably pretty guilty of this one um moving forward would you say you have some ideas for call it a formula or call it a playbook for that an owner can learn or develop to start to position themselves for like longer term marketing growth? Yeah. So um, like if, if you're recognizing that you're, that you're caught under the weight of your business, then, then it is important uh, for you to find a moment to, to take a step back and really understand like what's, what's claiming the most of your time and capacity, and then figure out if that, if that thing that's claiming the most of your time and capacity is something that's contributing to your North star, because if it's not contributing to your North star, um, you need to hand it off stop it or minimize it because it's not helping you grow your business and you'll be able to claim that, uh, claim that time back. And I, and I feel like, um, being able to really step back and 
and reset on what is it that I want to accomplish? What am I actually doing? Where's, where's the gap? You have to be able to get out from under the rubble, give yourself perspective, and then start reorganizing kind of the, the, the blocks of the, or chunks of things that are, that you're spending your, spending your time doing. And then not, not make it too big. Like if, if you're seeing that you, you have taken on uh, too many, too many services that, that are outside of your capacity, um, you, you've, too many programs, too many staff members, figure out a way to dial it back or reduce its impact so that you can focus on your North Star again. Like a step, I would say step back, uh, gain perspective, uh, see where you can clear some space to, to start working on the North Star again. And then, and then take small steps. Like it, it, as soon as we make something so big, we create barriers for ourselves. So when, when you are hitting a mental barrier or you are hitting a motivation barrier, you've made that whatever that is too big. So take a step back, figure out what, what the smallest next possible step is and move in that direction. And then, and then test it. It's like, how do you know if you are moving in the right direction? What's your success metric? And, and it, if you're not seeing that from that small step, try something else. It's just a, it's a continual and and continual iteration process. Yeah, and it's it, experimentation is definitely something in business, like not just the fitness industry, but just globally right now. It's becoming so much more mainstream. Mm -hmm. And I, a lot of business leaders these days, the thing that they do is, you know, if they have this new concept or this new idea both internally and mentally, they frame it as an experiment. So if they do get started with something in that sense, that if it doesn't go the way they planned, it's not a disaster. It's just an experiment that, you know, tested their uh, hypothesis and came out a little bit differently than they had, um, had originally thought it would. But that's kind of how you can do these little things to get longer term growth because you're, you're more set on, uh, on the things that you're working on longer term. Right. I, I totally, I totally agree with that. I like, I, uh, before I left basic fitness in the process of an agile transformation, uh, I was able to lead a team for a year and a half, which was the multidisciplinary team that was working on sprints that, that were, that was working with the, with the agile methodology. And if, if that word doesn't mean anything to you and you're, and you're listening to this, I think there's a really excellent, um, explanation of the Spotify agile methodology that you could just look up on, um, on YouTube somewhere, but the, the mindset behind it and the way that, um, that it works from an organization standpoint is it's everything is an experiment, but you put discipline behind the experiment. And what's funny is as, as personal trainers, this is what we do with our clients. They tell us our, their, their problems, we come up with a roadmap for their success, and then we set small milestones. We, ex we test the, the workout approach, the nutrition approach, we look at the results, and then we adjust accordingly. But it's actually precisely the same, um, the same approach that we need to take to our businesses, because it, it, th then we're constantly kind of making these small benchmarks and evaluating if what we're doing is working. But it's funny, the, the skill set is already there. We just have to apply it in, in a different way. Nice. Really cool. Okay. So thinking, you know, transitioning a little bit, we've talked about experimentation. Maybe this could be a good point to start to bring in what you think are some of those two to three quick wins, things that come to mind when thinking about how a gym or how a studio or how a personal trainer could improve their marketing strategy starting today or tomorrow? Yes. <clears throat> so uh, I feel like marketing strategy and customer experience are kind of like inextricably connected. So it, like your, your marketing strategy is actually the, the promise that you're making to your customers. And then uh, your kind of, your customer satisfaction is your, your, uh, um, is your report card on how you've fulfilled that that promise? So I I I, I my answer to this is is poss is possibly bigger than two to three things, but I'm going to work backwards to two to three things. So 
I hope that's okay. We're interested um, in all of them. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I, I really feel like the the most important thing for for any um, business owner in fitness who is working with clients or customers or members, whatever your or people, uh, what however you you call your people, is to really map out the customer journey. So if customer journey is a new word for you, again, like you can Google search customer journey mapping and there's a lot of tools that, that will really easily help you do that. So you don't have to make it complicated, but it's, it's really, um, it's, the, it's the relationship overview of, of your customers. Like, how did they get to know you? When did they decide they were going to engage in your service? Um, when you started getting to know each other, like what, what were those interactions? What were those interactions like? What were those things that you did that made you know that the relationship was going in the right direction or not? And what did you have to do to get the relationship back on track? And uh, how long did your relationship last and uh, when did you break up or were you able to get get it back on track? Like it's it, it is really kind of if you think about it in the in the context of a relationship, that is really the customer journey in its essence. And what I would advise um, uh, advise the listeners to do is if they have the relationship with their customers to actually, ask them, like, remember when you, when you first signed up for my service, can you tell me what you were looking for? What, what did you need? What was your, what, what problem were you trying to solve at that, at that part of the, at, at that part of our relationship? And then as you move through the phases, once they're identified, really understanding what your customer needed or needs at those phases, then what you need to do is look at your client communication and whether it's verbal communication, just one-on-one, -on -one, or you've got like an app or you've got a bunch of emails, look at your client communication, put it back on the journey. You can even post this on, on the wall, like print it out and post this on the wall. This is, this is what I used to do um, with the team at Basic Fit. And then look at what your customer sees, the information your customer sees per phase of the journey. So this could be like, um, social media ads right at the beginning to your welcome mail when you're onboarding them or whatever. And then, and then see if the information that you're giving is matching the need that they have. Uh, because then you can make sure that whatever marketing promise you're, you're making, you're actually fulfilling along the, the, the phases of the customer journey. So in, um, in my experience with, with customer journey mapping, um, you've got like the, the phases that, that I used to work with at basic fit was, were the, int the intention phase. So that's like the moment where I, we'd always make a little bit of a joke, uh, that someone was at the bottom of a pint of Ben and Jerry's and they were just like, Oh shit. I've really, oh, can I say that? <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> oh darn. Uh, I, I've really got to do something, uh, about, this, like, I can't believe I just ate a whole pint of ice cream. I need to go to the gym. And what was funny was the amount of people, this is pre COVID, the amount of people who used to sign up at two o'clock in the morning on Saturday was really high. So the, the joke was there was that, you know, bottom of a bottom of a pint of Ben and Jerry's or a bag of chips or whatever, like a, a capsule. And they're like, okay, now this is enough. I'm going to the gym. The turning point. <laughs> the turning point, definitely. So then you've got the intention and then the orientation phase is the next phase. And that is when um, you're really eva evaluating your options. So you're kind of gathering, like, what could I do to solve this problem? Um, and, and that's where you as a company have to make sure that you're showing up in the searches or that, that you are a solution during that phase. The consideration phase follows that. And that's when um, people are really trying to make a decision. Like they're, they're ready to make a, a decision, but it's between this or that. And then you have the, the purchase and the post purchase. So they've actually decided to buy your service what does that look like? What is your customer seeing in that phase? Is it, is it digital? Is it 
um, one-on-one, whatever that is, you need to, you need to make that visible and make sure that you're, you're, the message and the information that you're getting across to your, to your customer is, is lining up. Um, and then uh, post-purchase and post-purchase is where I'd like to zoom in on for the, the quick wins. Um, because like once, once you've, once you've got a customer making sure that they understand what they can expect from you and you understanding what they need, that's the, that's the most critical time in your relationship with the customer, because it's like, they've decided on you. It's a really vulnerable time for you both. A, a commitment has been made, but there's a lot of information gaps. So making sure that you understand their needs and they understand the expectations that they can, that they can get from you it are, is the most important thing to clarify in, in the onboarding process. And on the, on the intention and orientation phases, really understanding from your existing cu customers what they were looking for will help you target new customers like them. So those are those are some of the blind spots that you could fill in to, to, to make some quick wins that could work for your company. Awesome. Thank you for that. That's super insightful. Um, we've already talked a little bit about the, this North Star metric, but this was very high level in determining what, you know, as a business owner, your own North Star metric is. But okay. What kind of metrics ha have you either used or have you other seen other companies use to measure success when it comes to things like a, a marketing strategy? I mean, yeah, great question. Uh, like, obviously, whatever your core product or services, and because we're talking about um, very likely a studio, boutique, or uh, personal trainers, that that's going to be your member or clients. Uh, purchasing your your core business that that that's probably um, your uh, your north star metric. When you when you work backwards along the customer journey per phase, you can actually set KPIs, right? And and the KPIs are actually different per phase because the the conversion um, metrics that that you're looking at in orientation and consideration are not super interesting once you're in onboarding. So like every, uh, every that, th this is why I will always point back to your customer journey map, because th that way you can see where you are in your customer relationship if you're successful. So, um, you know, for, for the, uh, for the, for the client acquisition, it really depends on the campaign. So, and it depends on the channel that you're using for, for the campaign. Like um, it, you, you should probably know, like if you're using email marketing, you should probably know what like the average open, uh, click, click to open and then, um, and then website conversion rates are. As, as a general rule so that you have that as a benchmark, but you should also know this for your business so that you can see movement either way. Like if, it, if something is working less for you or more for you. And um, I've just seen so much difference in campaign performance between companies that while I say it's important to know the average benchmark, at the same time, it's more important to know whatever that is for your company, because uh, like like sometimes uh, you would say like a like a twenty percent opening rate for email is is great, but for but for your company you might have forty to sixty, and and twenty percent would be shit. So then you've got to you've got to look at what um, what movement is in in your in your side of the uh, of the business, at the end of the day, I, I believe you're looking for net uh, net member gain or net client gain uh, as the north star. And then in onboarding again, I think you have to move from the the conversion uh, KPIs to the engagement KPIs. So. <clears throat> 
and there, there is actually more information in our sector over the impact of the onboarding phase than there is in any other sector. So that in any other, sorry, in any other phase. So it's, it's something that you can easily Google and, and look for information on. Um, but uh, so for, I would say for onboarding, the, the number of visits that, that a member does in their onboarding phase, um, a, there are different um, scores that are less used in our sector, but are used in different um, uh, in, in other sectors, like uh, like uh, tech service sectors uh, that measure customer satisfaction. So there's three scores that I would encourage you to evaluate how you can implement in your um, in your journey, and that's. Uh, customer effort score. So how hard or easy was, was it to do something? So it could be like, uh, that could be like setting up your app or uh, completing a transaction. You've got customer satisfaction score. So how, how good did that feel? Good or bad did that feel for you to actually do whatever that was? Um, and then you have the NPS score and the NPS is the most used in our sector. So that's the net promoter score. How likely or unlikely would you be uh, to recommend this service to a friend or family member? And that's, that's a pretty good indication of uh, satisfaction with service. So what, what you're trying to measure when you move from like a, uh, acquiring a customer to having a customer is how happy are they with the purchase that they have made and and what behaviors are you looking um, for in terms of activity or feedback to to kind of paint this complete picture of of satisfaction awesome thank you and looking then that there are a lot of different ways to measure these kind of things uh, that, that you've just mentioned Mm -hmm. Would you say that there were any tools or maybe types of tools that you see being a key piece of the puzzle here, not necessarily aligning with any one operator or not, but just based on your own opinion and uh, experience in the industry? Yeah, um, like my, the bulk of my experience is, is with, uh, in terms of data and analytics is, is with basic fit and, and basic mm -hmm. fit had just a lot of resources thrown at that. So there was a lot mm -hmm. of data visibility. Having said that, um, my my husband and I ran a CrossFit box for uh, for three years and we used Virtua Gym. And okay. there's, a, there's, there's a lot of really valuable engagement uh, and activity data that you can get from your, from your members. So what I would say um, is that whenever you're evaluating a, a system for, for managing your business, um, make sure that you're not trying to cobble too many things together. Because when you're trying to cobble like this for transactions and, and that for, uh, for communication, then you never get the full picture of what's actually happening with your, your customer. And if you can really work towards an all-in-one solution and, you know, and, and, and until you get the ability to really just hire a team of developers, um, you'll never get a hundred percent of what you want. But if you can, if you can hit 80% of what you want in, from an off the box or off the shelf uh, solution that, that is going to give you a full picture of what's happening to, to your members from um, the point of acquisition all the way to the end of their relationship with you, then, then you'll be able to start steering the KPIs that, that, will, that will help you drive your business. Yeah, and it, reducing friction. So as you say, if you're trying to cobble too many things together, uh, that's something that could probably relate back to that customer experience score that you just mentioned. So if it is like if there's friction to do this and it doesn't connect well with this, these days, because technology, it is so connected to all to each other, when it's not, it even becomes more obvious, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. Like I, and, and it, like, if I can, if I can tangent just a second on that. You've got I, the floor. <laughs> yes. I think that um, in so many, in so many cases, we as business people, as entrepreneurs, we're trying to, to solve problems. And when, when I'm talking about like cobbling a system together, like you're trying to make everything work and, and it, like, all, all, yeah, just kind of thinking about the problem being solved, but not 
uh, remembering that there's a person that's going to be interacting with the with the system that that you're trying to put together. So um, even even in in basic where we had such a, a huge team and a ton of resources to work with, we were constantly forgetting user testing and, and to actually put the experience of the customer, like to continually go through the experience of the customer so that we could iron out the, the kinks. Um, if, if, you're, if you're solving your business problems only from your business perspective and not taking your customers into account, I can almost guarantee you the customer experience is gonna be garbage. Um, especially if you're trying to gar a, a couple a bunch of different technical solutions together because it just gets way too clunky. So make sure that you've got a trusted someone that can give you perspective on what the customer experience actually is. And, and again, that that's where um, you're almost always better suited to go with an all-in-one solution uh, than, than trying to, to come up with things uh, apart. And the other reason for that is, like, if you if you're if you're trying to communicate to your customer primarily through email, I, I don't know what your personal Gmail looks like, but mine is. I I think I've talked to Lavinia about this at some point. It's a vortex of hell. Like, yeah. <laughs> my my business email is that, so my personal email is just like, it's where spam goes to die and. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so the, you're probably not able to, to reach your, your customer the way that you want to. Your messages are not reaching your customer. So if you can think about a, a place where you can get their undiv undivided attention, and that's, that's really the all-in-one solutions where your members come into your environment and only uh, get the messages that you need them to interact with, it's harder to get them there from an onboarding standpoint, but it's way better in terms of the and the customer relationship and the customer life cycle. Yeah, nice, definitely. Yeah, there's. Um, I saw a report recently that seventy one thousand fitness related apps were launched in just twenty twenty alone. So there's just so much com competition for mind share and wallet share and and that focus right now that you're right, kind of just consolidating your efforts as much as possible. That can just make sure that there's that direct A to B line between you and your customer. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, kind of moving towards more than like industry trends. Uh, obviously, there's been massive structural shifts. Uh, you know, leaps and bounds forward as an industry globally than where we were about 365, 380 days ago, maybe let's say. Um, in your position, you work along a, a lot of trendsetters and industry leaders. You are one yourself. Um, could you share some insights on what you expect to come down the line, um, say throughout 2021 and maybe 2022, if we're not uh, already too early there? Yeah, I mean, like who knows after after last yeah. year, right? <laughs> All of the crystal balls are shattered. Um, I, I think you you nailed it when you when you uh, mentioned the kind of explosion of of apps in our in our sector, like the the what what what's happened is everything's changed and uh we we may have gotten into into our comfortable routines before the pandemic but since the pandemic we're constantly trying to find out what our new rhythms are so uh you know as as fitness consumers um uh, there, there's been a huge pivot to digital, which is cool because we found a place for digital in our in our world. We it, because we've had no other entertainment options, we've started to do things that like our parents and grandparents used to do, like go to the park and take a walk and maybe even run again. And actually, I think I, I I read a oh gosh, I'm I'm I can't quote the the stat, but I there there's been a huge upswing in the number of runners. Um, in, in the past year. So no big surprise there, but, um, people's perspectives, I believe have expanded from uh, having fitness be the, be the biggest shareholder in the idea of health to the, the definition of health expanding. So that means that the, that the fitness provider in the fitness sector is a part of the, of the health and wellness pie, but we have a different proportion now than we did pre lockdown. Um, and I think that means that we have 
less of a controlling stake in the health customer journey of people in general. So what we're going to have to do as a sector is figure out how we can play in the sandbox with different um, different solutions that the that the consumers are using so that we don't feel like um, so that they don't feel like we're trying to claim them and that they have to choose us and not not something else like uh, it, being being able to work with our work with our wearables and understand that maybe we've picked up some new um, fitness digital habits and that's going to work in in our in our new fitness equation or new health equation now um, and it is going to be something that I think uh, all, all fitness, business players are going to have to consider from, from the consumer perspective. And that points to the next thing um, that I think is really going to happen as a big change in our sector is that we're going to have to be a whole lot more flexible than we ever have been in terms of business model. So um, we, we, we've we been uh, known for like the 12 month membership contract that uh, you have to sign a child off to get out of somehow or, or sever a limb, something. But uh, because our members have had to be flexible with us during this period of lockdown, we're also going to have to be flexible with our business model. And I think that, that um, there's going to be more and more, uh, there's going to be more and more trailblazers who start coming up with different pricing models for the sector that will lead the way that that will that will create change and it, it's it's gonna, that's going to cause a shakeout really because um it, i mean the the membership model is how we're able to um build our business and pay our staff so so how do we do that if if that does not continue to be the primary way that we run our business um so, and I, I also think that uh, th there's a global shift in terms of the conversation around uh, community and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and our sector is gonna, gonna be having that conversation a whole lot more, not only professionally, like within the companies, but also in terms of uh, member communication and, and making sure that all members feel or all people feel welcome uh, to walk into our sector. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, and I think you you nailed it there for a little bit when you were talking about just this. There's going to be new people coming into the sector as well, and yeah. there's going to be new perspectives coming in. And I, I liken it a little bit to like a slingshot where we've been held back for so long for this past year, kind of just waiting and seeing what's happening. And COVID didn't really create a lot of these new behaviors. It just accelerated the trends by a whole lot. And so those who are there to kind of capture that new energy and that new momentum and that new customer once the the, the uh, metaphorical slingshot here is released, I think those are going to be the ones who who definitely are poised to win out and are poised to kind of thrive in this post COVID uh, industry that we hope is coming sooner rather than later. Sooner, sooner, sooner. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and do you think uh, on top of what we've just mentioned here? I mean, where do you think the industry is going to go specifically with some of these big players coming in, like the Apple Fitness uh, and the Pelotons of the world? Um, you know, where do you see these kind of things playing out longer term? I mean, I think I think what what's the coolest thing to see when you're like at the end of the day, I'm I'm still uh, just an ambitious personal trainer. So the I always look at it from a behavior standpoint for for people. Like when I look at what Apple's doing and what Peloton's doing, um, they're, they're doing things that we know have to happen to, to get people fit. So they're making it accessible. They're making it from like, you, you can take a bite or you can take the whole pizza and it just depends on how much capacity you have. So you can kind of, you can kind of work with, with the dials of their offering to really make it relevant to you because they're collecting your data and, and they built their business around personalization and experience. They're making it relevant for you and they're making it fun. And, and it's got to be fun. You've got to want to do 
the workout in order to do the workout. And, and they're becoming masters of, uh, of creating a personal, accessible, super fun, super sticky experience with the community. So they've, they've got the formula. Awesome. Yeah. Should be interesting to see how it plays out for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, hey, as we, we, we start to wrap up a little bit here, uh, I, I definitely wanted to call attention to the fact that, you know, you are a C-level executive female in the fitness industry. Yep. Um, I, I'd be curious from your position, like what advice you might have for those looking to follow a similar path uh, that, you, that you've taken? We, we chatted about this really, really quickly yesterday. And my, my best advice I can give anyone is to, is to find a mentor. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is so important from a, from a perspective standpoint and just to be able to create a map for your own growth, uh, to, to continually learn and lean on, um, other people. And, uh, it's, it's never hard to do. Like once you've decided you're going to look for a mentor, it's, it's amazing how they kind of spring up like mushrooms. So I think like that, that's one of the things that I love about WIFA because part of the membership is, uh, you can continually do peer mentorships or leadership mentorships all the time. So that, that would be my biggest advice to anyone, get a mentor, stay on the mentor path and back to purpose. Like if you know what your purpose is, then it's going to make the, the decision-making process for your career pretty, pretty easy. So you can say yes with confidence. And, uh, you can also say, uh, no, I call it elevated no's like you're, you're saying no, but you know why you're saying no. Um, and that's, that's pretty important too. Awesome. Yeah. And mentors, well, hopefully most of the time are pretty chock full of uh, good advice for those that, uh, that they're helping out. W would you say you have any really good advice that you've received over the years uh, that, that maybe you would want to share today? Yeah, it, 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 go, it goes back to that. So I think I've got, I've got two fairy god sisters in my career. Uh, and they're pretty amazing ones. So like, if you, if you're, if you've been in fitness for a while, you know, who Emma Berry is and Maureen Hagen. Um, but they, they've been close to me through mo for most of my career. And in a, in a moment where I really felt that I, I had lost my way, they both asked very ser serendipitously, um, in a two week period, like about my purpose, like Jennifer, what is your why? And I'm like, uh, what? Uh, and, and I, I could like, I realized that I didn't have a clear answer for that. And uh, so this isn't really advice other than know your why, uh, but I, but it, it took me a good two year journey also working with a, with a peer mentor to map out what that process was for myself and, and, and for my mentor, because she was, she was on a, a similar path. And then, and then we worked out a system to help other women find their purposes so that it's that's the best piece of advice i can give in personal or in business is is to be very clear about your purpose and then everything else will be clear for you awesome very very nice good to hear yeah and on the on the side that you know if you're doing some reading or if you're doing your own research like maybe there were some book recommendations that that you've gotten a lot of value from that you would uh, advise to those listening in yes i i'm um absolutely addicted to audiobooks. Uh, like, as you know, as a dog owner, um, <laughs> I, I like long dog walks and I'm always listening to something. So I've got, I'm either reading something on my Kindle or listening to something in my, in my, uh, earphones. Uh, so my favorites, I think over the past two years, I have three, uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear, uh, Dare to Lead by Brene Brown, but you could read the whole library of Brene Brown. It's all amazing. And uh, mindset by Carol Dweck. Great, yeah, Atomic Habits. I would, uh, I would definitely agree with that one. I'll have to check out the other two. I, I haven't read those ones yet, but uh, Atomic Habits definitely very high on the list. Like uh, game changer, well. yeah. Super, super actionable, super actionable. Okay, um, and then yeah, finally, oh, always one of those uh, great final questions on a, a webinar and a podcast. Where can listeners of today's show go to learn more about you or maybe to connect with you and, and find out more about what you're doing? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a social media girl, everything except for Twitter. And I have a really unique last name. So uh, Halsall, H-A-L-S-A-L-L. -L. So I'm, I'm pretty easy to find on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram. But that, that, that would be the way. Or Jennifer at womeninfitness.org, send me an email. But please understand that, that I call my email affectionately a vortex of health. So that's probably the, the least preferred channel, but it's still an option. Okay, didn't get that name for, for no reason, actually. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, Jennifer, really, really appreciate your time and your insights today. Uh, it was great to have you on. My pleasure.